So while we're waiting for everyone to join, let me just start off by saying good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society's virtual author series. Today, we are so honored to have Laura Norton, the author of the newly released Lay Them to Rest on the Road with the, with the Cold Case Investigators Who Identify the Nameless. Before we get started, I would just like to say, uh, remind everyone to please check out all of our exciting upcoming programs at our website, HudsonLibrary.org. We have a lot coming up this year, and I know we have already have so many exciting programs planned for next year. You can purchase copies of Lay Them to Rest from our local independent bookstore, The Learned Owl, and we'll include the link in the chat below if you'd like to purchase the book. At any point during this event, you can ask questions. Please leave your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. All right, now that that's out of the way, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Laura Norton is a writer, researcher, and host of the award-winning, critically acclaimed podcast, The Fall Line. It's a deeply researched podcast covering cold cases in the Southeast. She also hosts a paranormal, otherworldly, and unex uh, podcast um, from the American Newspaper Archives called One Strange Thing. Previously, she was a principal senior lecturer at Georgia State University, where she taught creative writing, podcasting, and digital media. She has published short stories and fiction since the early 2000s. Her new book, Lay Them to Rest, came out October 17th and focuses on the forensic science of an unidentified persons while following her experience trying to identify a Jane Doe homicide victim found in Illinois in State Park in 1993. She brings the reader along for the ride as she attempts, her and the experts attempt to solve the case. Laura, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, sorry for going on mute. I just heard my family pulling in the garage, so I decided to just mute them a little bit there. You're good. I'm so glad to be here and, and to speak to you tonight and so glad to see so many patrons. Um, I have a special love for the public library system. I was just um, begging help from a librarian in Nashville about mm, four hours ago. So library mm -hmm. are my favorite. Um, place to go seek help and knowledge. So I'm glad to be here. I was wondering if you could, before we get started into more of the deeper questions for the evening, if you could just briefly describe the book for those of you who haven't read it, which I will have to say, I absolutely loved it. So I highly recommend it. Um, but just give us a brief description of what the book is about for those of us who haven't started it yet. Absolutely. Um, and I do have a PowerPoint as a former professor. I can't really help myself. Uh, you set up a PowerPoint, you start going. Um, and I will be referring to that a couple of times. I'll slide share a few times. Um, but the long and short of it is that about 2015 or so, my life changed in a lot of ways. Um, I had a very young child at that point. Um, my son was still in his newborn phase. And that's when I began listening to podcasts. Um, many of you probably heard of Serial. That's, uh, you know, Serial came out in 2014, 2015. I was a little late on the boat there, but that's when I discovered Serial. And when you have a young child, um, you're often holding still for long periods of time. So I'd have like a baby on me and it didn't have many places I could go. So I would sit and think of things I could do while holding very still and not making any noise. And listening to podcasts was one of those things. And I was doing a lot of like lesson planning during that time as well, while holding still, you know, on maternity leave. And I was listening to Serial and thinking about all the fascinating ways that cold cases, um, wrongful convictions and cases where people really uh, perhaps had disagreement um, and cases where people maybe hadn't heard of the victims or even the suspects before could be used in classroom discussions. Because I knew that my students found those difficult, complex discussions so interesting. And as soon as I got back in the classroom, um, I wanted to talk to my students about serial. And we started talking about serial. But very soon, I wanted to find things that were closer to home for them. Um, we were from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Georgia State University. And I began to look for cases that maybe they hadn't heard of. Um, I've always been interested in finding media on lesser known subjects to talk to my students about. And I very quickly found cold cases from our own area. And I'd bring in articles for my students to talk about, go straight to our university library, 
um, dig into the archival sources there. And I'd bring them in and say, okay, what can you tell me about how these articles were written? Um, how are the victims portrayed? How are the suspects, if they're already portrayed? Um, why does this case have more coverage than this case? And we'd have the most interesting discussions. Um, and we'd really do a lot of analyzing of writing and composition. And as I dug further and further, um, I eventually heard about a case of twins from Augusta, Georgia, who disappeared in 1990. And I went looking for the coverage of their case because I wanted to share it with my students. And I was really surprised to discover there was no coverage of their case. Not a single news article had been written. And I was disturbed by that because of course, when twins go missing, you would assume that that would be um, something pretty striking to the media. Um, twins going missing is a very unusual thing to happen, whether they're, you know, babies who were kidnapped or runaways, what have you. But there was absolutely no archival news coverage from the time they went missing. There was some news coverage from when their case was reopened in 2013. Um, and I was like, okay, well, maybe we just don't have it at the university. So I traveled down to Augusta, Georgia to look for it there. There still wasn't any. And my students and I um, began to discuss why that might be. And it just sat with me and really bothered me. Um, I spent the past couple of years really focused on crime in my classrooms and discussing social issues, so many other things that it had taught me a lot. It just so happened that at that time, I got a grant to teach a podcasting class. I had planned on maybe making just a little one-off podcast about mm, fiction writing or something. That's my area. But I thought to myself, well, if there's nothing about this cold case, maybe it would be more useful to make something about this cold case. So there is media available on it. Um, and it just so happened that that's what I ended up doing, working with a longtime friend of mine, um, a colleague who's a licensed professional counselor um, and the family of the twins who are still missing to this day, we ended up producing a podcast. Um, and that podcast um, became something um, that had a life of its own um, and became a podcast that began to really focus on covering cases throughout the Southeast and beyond um, that focused on cold cases with little or no media footprint. Um, we began to work with other families. We began to look with, lo with law enforcement. We began to work with experts. And pretty soon we were the people who families and law enforcement came to to cover cases that had no media um, because we had their archival skills available to produce that um, coverage. And what I eventually discovered was there was one particular kind of case that had no coverage at all. And those were the cases of John and Jane Doe's. Um, if you're unfamiliar with John and Jane Doe cases, these are victims we also call unidentified decedents, people, who, people whose identities are not known. And these cases are so difficult to cover because they're difficult to write about. If, if a victim is found and you don't know their identity, there's only so much you can say, particularly if that victim happens to be skeletal remains. You'll oftentimes see a headline that says, um, bones found in a parking lot, you know, bones found behind a church. And that's all you're going to see, you know, maybe a scant paragraph one time, um, and that's it. And it's not necessarily the fault of anyone. How is a reporter going to cover that with any particular depth? But when we found out about these cases, um, I was really concerned because of course, unidentified persons are missing persons. Unidentified persons are homicide victims. All of these cases are connected. And to solve one case, you need to solve another case. But first you have to get people interested in the cases of unidentified persons. And you have to get people to see unidentified persons as people, as victims. You have to get them emotionally invested in those cases. So I decided that we really needed to, to begin to focus on trying to humanize those cases of unidentified persons and try and get our listeners to emotionally connect with them. Um, and by that point, we had a good working relationship with a lot of law enforcement and we're able to get those case files. But when you get the case file of an unidentified person, um, what you're likely to get is a lot of scientific language. And unfortunately, um, my degrees are in creative writing. 
Um, I took one science class my senior year of college um, and it was zoology and it was the last semester and he passed me with a C because uh, he felt sorry for me so I could <laughs> grad- go on to graduate school in creative writing. And I was kind of ruining the day at that point. Um, but I said, okay, I got to learn this stuff so I can understand these cases, these toxicology reports I was finding, forensic anthropology reports, the study of bones, um, forensic odontology reports, the study of teeth. Um, at some points, there had been some DNA testing, um, anatomy reports, forensic pathologists, medical examiners, so many different kinds of reports that I didn't have the language and the knowledge to understand. So I began reaching out to experts who were so patient and so kind, and for some reason willing to teach me the things I needed to know because they were passionate about having these cases solved too. And so over the years, um, as I began to cover John and Jane Doe cases, I developed a network of friends, of experts, who were willing to come on my show and willing to teach me. And they soon discovered that I had a skill set that was useful to them too. Um, and that I did a kind of research that was not common in their field, um, researching outside of the scientific realm, outside of the kind of research that law enforcement does. Um, not only digging through, you know, newspaper archives, but census records, you know, going and finding old yearbooks, doing interviews in the field um, is another big thing that I do. All the kinds of research um, that archivists do and more. And we began to collaborate together on projects. And that's how I ended up where I am today, which is working collaboratively in teams of scientists, sometimes law enforcement, artists, et cetera, to try and solve cases that are underfunded um, and to try and resolve the identities of victims who are often homicide victims and at least get them closer to having their cases fully resolved. And one thing that's important there is that it really does, for a lot of people, reconnect the idea that unidentified persons are missing people because the first step of that is reconnecting them to their identities, which is often that of a missing person. And then it takes it to the next step of figuring out what happened to them and why. So that's how my book came about. Um, I wanted to write a book that gave people access to the science that solves missing, per- solves unidentified persons cases. Um, and also shows you why some cases get solved and other cases don't. And the second part of that formula was to take you step-by-step step through a case as it got solved. A case that I worked on and was lucky enough to follow um, some brilliant scientists on as I solved the case of a woman who was known as Ina Jane Doe. Um, a homicide victim who was found at an Illinois state park in 1993. Um, And she was very sadly found um, as only partial human remains. Um, Her head and a few of her vertebrae were found in the state park. And um, very, very unfortunately, she was found by children um, at that state park in Illinois. And for 30 years, her case was cold um, until the Jefferson State, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office in Illinois was willing to work with myself and my collaborators on trying to get her case solved. And that's how the book came about. I mean, what led you to discovering this case and focusing on this, I thought was fascinating. And just the amount of, I mean, because the case, she was discovered in, in 93 and you, it wasn't solved. Not that it's not solved, because it's still an ongoing. They don't know, killed her. But I mean, to find her name came in what you found that was all pieced together in twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah. So, if you want, you want me to talk a little bit about how we came upon this case. That would be that would be fantastic. So let me. Um, I, I will at this point. I'm going to share my screen you guys don't mind. Let me not, okay. So let me, this is just like teaching. I have to slowly click on things. So this art, as you see here, um, this is some pretty striking forensic art. um, And I do wanna talk about that. So I'd heard of the case of Ina Jane Doe for years, probably before I even started 
my podcast. Um, I've always been interested in cold cases. And when I say interested, um, I think a lot of people are fascinated by crime. I've always been bothered by crime. I'm always bothered by what is the factor that's keeping a case from being resolved, I guess, is the best way of answering that. Um, and this was a case that I was aware of because this forensic guard has been widely circulated. And it was widely circulated because it was very striking um, to people. And this forensic art was meant to capture um, what at the time in 1993 were some possibly specific features of the victim. Um, and I, I do want to really stress here that the forensic anthropologist who examined the victim in 1993, who was then known as Ina Jane Doe, um, and she was known as Ina Jane Doe because her remains were found near the town of Ina, Illinois. And the forensic or the forensic anthropologist who examined her at the time did not diagnose her with any particular um, illness or any particular specific anatomical issues. Um, that's not the job of forensic anthropologist. She simply noted that Ina Jane Doe had some mild skeletal asymmetry and that based on some arthritis and some possible anomalies in her vertebra, that she may have had a condition called torticollis, which used to be known as Rynek, but may was the key word there, right? May. And then the job of a forensic artist is to take a combination of a lot of factors, um, the notes of a forensic anthropologist, the notes of a forensic pathologist, um, photographs from the scene, and to then interpret that into art. And I'm lucky enough to be friends with one of the best forensic artists in the United States. Her name is Kelly Lawson. She's here at the GBI in Georgia. And I know for her, this is not her art, but for her, you know, she'll do art. And then um, if the art is not striking a chord with people, she very well may update that art, for instance, right? So this art in this case, um, the art that is in color is a clay um, reconstruction and the art that's in black and white was a drawing. This was art that was the original art that was constructed in the early nineties. And the artists, both artists in this case were shooting for um, someone, someone you know, roughly in middle age, um, which is what you go for if you're not sure. And that's because the forensic anthropologist was working with really limited remains, you know, and could only guess that the victim was somewhere between 30 and 55 and may have had some mild skeletal asymmetry. Um, and the expression the artist went for was more than mild skeletal asymmetry. And I felt very strongly when I saw this art that had been circulating since the 90s, that if the art was accurate, someone who loved this woman or knew her, knew her would have recognized her by this point. Um, and my friend, Dr. Amy Michael, who is a forensic anthropologist who I met through the show, through the, through the fall line, was from the town, was from a town very near Ina, Illinois. And she felt very similarly because she'd been seeing this art since she was very young. Um, and she felt that if someone recognized this woman, you know, they would have called by then and this case would have been solved. She believes very strongly that skeletal reanalysis should happen in cold cases every five to 10 years. And that's because the art of forensic anthropology is not a static art. Um, and I called it an art, I should call it a science, but it's some of both, right? Of course it's a science, but I mean, everything is subjective. Um, science is subjective in its own way. And the science of forensic anthropology has changed and developed since 1993, and it will always change and develop. People learn new things, um, getting a second set of eyes on something is always really important. So she believes that, you know, for instance, an ancestry estimate, um, an ancestry is another way of saying race, um, even a sex estimate, you know, um, and that's particularly true for children and teenagers. It can be harder to estimate the sex of a child or teenager than you might imagine um, because of them not having gone through full puberty yet. Um, so they don't have all the changes you might imagine. Um, all of these things are factors that can lead to um, someone's characteristics that we call the biological profile, which is age, stature, ancestry, and sex, those things can be updated. Um, and 
a, a new set of eyes can maybe spot an old injury that someone hadn't seen before, just so many things. So she felt strongly that a new skeletal analysis in this case could be helpful. She felt strongly that me coming in and doing some research could be helpful. Um, coming in and looking at, you know, not just the databases of missing persons, but a lot of other things could be helpful. Um, we thought that it would be really helpful to have new art done. We thought it would be really helpful to have an anatomist come in and look at the case. We thought it would be helpful to have new dental um, examinations done. And we thought it would be especially helpful to have forensic investigative genetic genealogy done. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this concept um, from hearing about the Golden State Killer in 2018 being identified. Um, and that's taking the same kind of DNA that you use in an ancestry test or a 23andMe test, but you take that same kind of DNA and it's put into a public database, something like GEDmatch. So it doesn't get run through the database that you're using, you know, to find your relatives and to trace your, you know, ancestry, but you take that same um, type of DNA and you upload it to a public database that's used for law enforcement, like GEDmatch. Um, and you can actually trace people much farther than you'd be able to with the classic DNA, which is called STR DNA, that we're used to hearing about on like, you know, law and order, criminal minds, et cetera. Because that kind of DNA can only find very close relatives. So we believe that using one of these methods, we could perhaps help to identify. Um, this particular woman. And why this case? Um, it was just a case that had bothered me for a long time, Amy for a long time. We have a list of 40 or 50 cases um, that we keep on a, a Google Doc together that we want to work on because we've just kind of flagged them as cases where maybe if some money came into the department, it, it could be really useful. Um, when a case goes cold, the department's not necessarily going to have money to throw at that case. And that's when outside people can be useful and can help. So that's why we wanted to come in and help. Um, Alexandra, did you have any questions at this point? I do. Um, I was wondering, one of the things, I mean, there was a lot that was illuminating during this, but I think one of the things was DNA is so often thought of as like the end all be all answer, or it's like once you have the DNA, like it'll just unlock everything. And what your book really highlighted and put it in terms that made it very easy to understand was just how many other fields are necessary, and that DNA is a great tool, but it's not the tool for all of this. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the other fields because I know you touched on it, like um, the forensic. Uh, uh, dentistry and the orthodontist in the dental records, I thought was also fascinating. And as yeah. a field I didn't study or didn't know too much about myself. There are, I mean, if you think about it this way, um, yeah. whoa, okay. I'm just going to throw things around my desk. Don't mind me guys. Uh, I'm sorry if I just gave anyone the shock of their lives. Um, so you have to remember cases were being solved for years and years and years before we had forensic investigative genetic genealogy or even the DNA science that preceded that, right? Um, forensic anthropologists solve cases through, you know, comparisons, uh, skeletal comparisons every day. We just don't see it in the news. Um, and by the way, this I just wanted to also show this is that skeletal asymmetry I was talking about. I hope everyone can see how mild that is. Um, that's very mild skeletal asymmetry. And we all have skeletal asymmetry. I have skeletal asymmetry. Every person watching this has some kind of skeletal asymmetry. We all do. Um, you know, don't don't stare at me too much, but one of my eyes is bigger than the other one. Um, see if you can spot it while I'm talking. But, you know, skeletal asymmetry, you know, some of us have, you know, this is a very um, normal thickening of the frontal bone. Um, many women have due to hormonal, you know, hormonal issues. This happens especially um, during uh, menopause, but can happen earlier, for instance. Um, but one thing that you were just talking about is specifically, let me actually, oh, why is it going to go? Hold on one second. This is what I wanted to go to, teeth, which is what you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So, Dental records are in many ways as unique as fingerprints, even more so, um, because we're more likely to have dental records than we are to have fingerprints, uh, for one thing. I'm sure some people who are listening right now have been fingerprinted, um, but I haven't been fingerprinted since I was a little kid and they did those fingerprint drives, um, you know, when they and they give them to your parents and your parents storm away and lose them. 
but I sure do have dental records. Um, and my dental records, you know, the map of my mouth um, is something that is totally unique. Probably no one else has precisely the same dental work that I do. I mean, I'm sure there's someone out there, but probably not in my dentist office, right? And identifying someone based on their teeth is something uh, that is considered to be, you know, a concrete identification. And it's low cost. Um, it's something that is easy to do, you know, if DNA is not available. It's something that you can even do if someone's remains, unfortunately, have been lost, as long as you have those dental records. Let's say that a person was cremated um, before they knew that DNA was important, but they kept those dental records. And you don't even have to have an x-ray like this. You can simply have what's called a dental chart. And I bet many people listening now have seen those where the dentist writes down like on a picture of your teeth what your dental work is. That can be used to identify someone. In this case, um, the woman who was known as Ina Jane Doe had uh, a tooth with three roots in it where normally a person would have two roots. And she had a crown done. And it was specifically an old fashioned kind of crown that's usually done, had kind of fallen out of fashion by the 90s. And two different dentists said to us, you know, you see a lot of that. You see a lot of those done in the military. Um, and it was kind of interesting to hear. But the tooth was unique enough that when she was discovered, um, the odontologist who examined her actually ran the tooth. In the American uh, Dental Association's magazine, because that was something people used to do back in the 90s to try and identify people. They'd say, We have found, we have an unidentified, you know, woman, a Jane Doe, and she has this particular tooth. Um, if you worked on this woman, if you recognize this tooth, please write in, call, you know, call the sheriff's department. And that was the way people got identified, you know, before the internet, because teeth are so unique. I actually have a section right here of a tooth, um, and this actually is from Ina Jane Doe. And if you can see those little red arrows pointing down there, those are actually what are called Wilson bands. And those are stress marks on your teeth that actually mark different periods of stress you go through in your life. Um, so that can mark like childhood sickness. Um, it can mark like if you had a major trauma, malnutrition, all kinds of things. So your teeth actually tell all kinds of stories about you um, that are unique to you in many ways. So these are our, our teeth. I'm, I'm really passionate in, about dental records, knowing where your loved ones go to the dentist, knowing that if someone in your family, God forbid, does go missing, that one of the things you need to be really sure of is that their dental records are collected that their dental records do make it to law enforcement. Um, and knowing that that is a low cost and very efficient way um, of identifying someone as well, because people tend to forget about that. But DNA, um, expensive, sometimes difficult. Dental records is a really clear way of identifying a person. So um, one thing I, I do want to show you really quick before I pop back over to um, Alexandra is I showed you that original dental art. After Amy did her skeletal reanalysis of Ina Jane Doe um, and noticed that her skeletal, her skeletal asymmetry was really mild, there was actually new art done and it looked more like that. So that was something that was recirculated. Um, several months after the fact, and um, it had it was quite a striking difference for a lot of people to see that. I think when I found when I saw the her actual photo versus the sketch at the end was illuminating to see the differences. I also um, one of the things I enjoy you do talk about a lot how they attempted to solve the case when they were initially found her. And you know, I mean, all the changes in, I mean, obviously technology has wildly changed <laughs> since the years past um, and just the level of resources that are available to um, police who are trying to solve the case now, just the amount of money that's allocated to cold cases um, and solving them and what you have today. I was wondering if you could touch on what are some of the changes you've seen or you mean over your time you've been studying this and how we can help identify those? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, so we worked with, we were lucky enough to work with two companies 
um, that helped us to identify her. And the first is Astrea Labs. Astrea Labs were able to identify a DNA profile for Ina Jane Doe. Um, and the DNA profile, we were lucky enough to have both teeth and hair available, but they were actually able to use a single rootless hair. Um, but I need to make clear that we were able to do that on a grant. Um, Amy and I paid for this out of our own pockets to get this done. Um, and that's one case, right? So imagine all the doe cases out there that aren't funded. Um, and the problem there always comes back down to funding. Um, and then Redgrave Research, um, they, you know, we paid for the forensic investigative genetic genealogy um, for them. And they are a very cost-effective company as well, you know? Um, it does happen that we know them, you know, that is helpful <laughs> that we know them as well. And they're the ones that did um, the genetic genealogy in the case um, that identified her. And once that DNA profile was developed and was uploaded to GEDmatch, they ID'd her in six hours. So just the striking notion that that, that was waiting there, do you know what I mean? That we had the ability to ID her so quickly and that it could be done for so many other people. Um, it's one of those things that's sad and frustrating. And we know the limitations, it comes out so much of it comes down to funding. And it's not as simple as just that, you know what I mean? But most departments don't have seven to $10,000 to throw at every cold case. So, I mean, one of the obvious answers is that there are several nonprofits that pay for this kind of testing. I mean, I work a lot with Season of Justice. They have DNA grants and they have family awareness grants that help families pay for billboards and things like that. Um, another thing we hope is that testing becomes um, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, as the science develops. Um, but another thing um, that's free is simply circulating cases because a sad fact is that her family um, and I'm about to show you who she is. Her family, that's who she is. Um, her family was only living one state away from where she was discovered. And they never saw a single headline uh, about her when she was missing. And even if they had seen a headline, they wouldn't have recognized the headline because it simply said, woman's decapitated head found. And she was living all the way down in Tennessee when she disappeared. Her family's from Indiana and she was found in Illinois. So when she went missing, um, you know, if there had been more reporting, um, the details of the reporting, if there had been descriptions, you know, um, if, you know, more art had been done, had been circulated more widely. We looked at how we reported on unidentified persons. I mean, I have a lot of solutions. How practical they are, I don't know, right? All I know is that her family is kind of haunted by the fact that they were living, you know, less than 200 miles away and never heard a whisper of this case, right? While they were actively looking for her. Um, so it's a frustrating situation. Oh, I know there's several questions popping up too. There's a lot and we'll get to them. So if you have questions for Laura, please make sure to leave them in the Q&A. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. I'm, I am curious because from reading this book, I know there's a few people and I'm thinking one of Carl and I'm for, I apologize to Carl in advance for me butchering their name, Carl Copenman, the Carl forensic Hoppen. artist. Carl Koppelman. Thank you. Um, and he first got introduced into the world of forensic science. He said, he wrote something about like through web sleuths. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of like internet detective or like you had talked about raising awareness and what role, because I know there's a great interest in true crime and cases. What role, if any, should they play? Oh, well, I mean, that's kind of complex. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it just depends. I mean, I think for Carl Koppelman, like Carl Koppelman, um, I am trying to figure out how to stop sharing my screen right this second. Hold on. Um, so Carl Koppelman, like, in terms of web sleuthing, like he ended up, so Carl pa Koppelman is the person who did the art you guys saw. And I think like what his um, 
what he decided to do was he was actually at home taking care of his mom um, when she was really ill. And he got interested in checking up on the J.C. Dugard case because he hadn't heard anything about it for a while in the news. And he discovered in Web Sleuth the Doe section of the case, right? And the Doe section of the site. And he was disturbed to find that a lot of Doe cases didn't have art. Um, and a case not having art is one of the reasons it didn't get shared, you know, doesn't get shared. And he was more disturbed that the, a lot of the cases that did have art didn't have very good art. So he decided, you know, he'd been always been good at art. He'd taken a lot of drawing classes, although he was an accountant. So he decided to start doing art, right? Um, and a lot of, you know, police departments were pleased with his art. And he's, you know, he volunteers his time. That's what he does. So he's gone on to do a lot of volunteer work for DNA Doe Project um, and a lot of other law enforcement. I was just emailing with a department today about having Carl do some art for them um, because they didn't have art that they needed. So I think that's like the best case scenario. You know what I mean? Um, and I just did a Q&A with Unresolved Mysteries on Reddit about like, what's the most responsible way to help a case, right? And to me, if you really want to help a case, um, the best way to help a case is to help signal boost the fact that a case exists, right? Um, help build the knowledge base on a case by um, making everything you can find on the case available. Um, one thing that I found is that a lot of departments don't have the archival news on a case in their files. So, you know, the first thing I do is hand over all the archival news I have. So if you're someone who likes to likes to research and do that kind of stuff, you can offer, um, you can say, I have gathered this information on the case. Would you like it? Right. I mean, they may say, you know, they may say, yes, that's something you can do. Um, you can make sure that you share a case a lot on social media. Um, you can make flyers for a case, you know, if it's a case where you haven't seen a flyer for, you know, you can make a case like, you know, you know, unidentified person with the facts about a case, put it on social media. That's all that great responsible stuff. I think that's useful. Um, stuff that's irresponsible, um, you know, theorizing irresponsibly about a case, uh, you know, witness names being released, um, accusing people of murder. I think all the stuff any, you know, <laughs> responsible person would consider to be, you know, uh, questionable. Those are the things to avoid. Sounds good. Um, and then I know before we turn it over, I, one of the things I enjoyed is I liked how the, your book, the way it was laid out, the chapters went back and forth between the case and then the method of all the different departments, all the different areas of forensic science that were involved, which you listed in there's so many. Was there one that was the most, I don't know, was there a field that you didn't know as much about going into it or did you learn something that was, I mean, eye-opening? Because to me, the most of it, including the investigative genetic genealogy to me was, I knew very little and was fascinated. So oh, teeth. Um, and now I've become really like obsessed with teeth. Um, <laughs> odontology. Um, I was at the American Academy of Forensic Science um, 2022. And I spent most of my time at odontology lectures learning about teeth. Um, and I've gotten lucky enough to get to know Dr. Richard Scanlon, um, who was one of, you know, the most decorated forensic odontologists in the country. Um, he was a uh, on the ground at 9-11, he's on the ground at um, Katrina, he was on the ground at many of the terrible fires in California, identifying people person after person. And just some of the stories he told me um, about the incredible work odontologists have done to identify people. Sometimes, uh, you know, at the site of a plane crash, oftentimes with a single tooth to me, um, just the level of skill that takes, but also the reason why they're doing it, which is to identify someone for their families, um, just hearing those stories to me was really emotionally affecting and made me appreciate that, you know, a lot of them say, you know, we're going to be obsolete at some point, you know, because of DNA, And I, but I really don't think so. I still think that odontology is an incredibly needed science. So learning about that for me was really enlightening. I think from reading your book and learning a little bit more is you realize that, well, DNA is fantastic and it's such a useful tool that so many other fields play such critical roles in solving cases and depending on all of that um 
I also do want to just stress that I know that you guys just saw kind of a teaser of a woman. Um, I do want you to know that you find out a lot more about her in the book um, and about her family, who not only um, did I spend a lot of time with, but I'm still spending time with. So there's a lot more there. I And then one of the things you mentioned in your book, you talk about that once you've ID'd her, I mean, the case is still ongoing. Um, the fact that the family is still searching for. Yeah, I'm I'm currently offering, a, along with Dr. Amy Michael, a $10,000 reward in the case. So we're currently working on that right now. Um, right now, um, Clarksville, her name's um, Susan Lund, and Clarksville, Tennessee is plastered with billboards at this very moment. Um, we're trying to get her case solved, so. We have, um, we're gonna turn over to some questions. If anyone has any, please leave them in there. Um, Heather would like to know, um, what would you say are resources that can be used to help finding um, a missing person? Like she's also looking at for like internationally um, if they're not found in DNA programs. So international cases are hard um, because we have the best, we have the best systems here. And a lot of it has to do with freedom of information in the United States, access to information. Um, we have the best databases. We have NamUs. We have, um, you know, Do Network. Um, we have um, better access to cases. We have, you know, the, the right to FOIA. Um, it, it's bar none the best in the U.S. Um, I have more difficulty working on international cases. Um, you know, it's the bar to entry even in other English speaking countries is difficult. Um, I know this is not the question people, <laughs> the answer people wanna hear, but even working um, in um, Canada, Australia, working in the UK um, is more difficult because simply it's harder for the public to access that information. Um, now, certainly um, law enforcement agencies will have on their personal web, like on their personal pages, not personal, but on their official pages, they will have um, bulletins up. I mean, they will have things run in the paper, but the publicly accessible databases that we have simply are not there. Um, I have found um, in Latin America a couple of databases um, that people are building out themselves that can be useful. Um, and I do talk about GCLEF, which is a group that's interested in DNA, and that's G-C-L-A-I-T-H. Um, and that's a series of initials. It's basically um, human identification. It's a group of um, interested in hu human identification based on DNA that's operating um, in uh, Latin America largely. Um, although it does involve a few other Spanish speaking countries um, that are not in Latin America um, and a few countries that aren't Spanish speaking that are in Latin America. But um, they are building out a couple of databases and also involving some citizens who aren't officially with the organization. They're building out databases too, but there's nothing like on the level of what we have here sadly. So what I do is a lot of digging around on message boards, um, a lot of just, you know, trying to check newspapers, um, but it's hard. I was going to say, I know it's not necessarily about the book this evening, but for your podcast, you're known for your research and how in depth everything goes and the lengths you go to do that research. How long would that take that whole process for you? It depends. Um, it can be three months to two years. Um, we, I've, I've spent two years on something before. So uh, podcast wise, yeah, not a series. It just depends. Uh, we have someone who was cur curious about the case for Susan. They wanted to know about what was still going on. And it's still, like we said, an open case in that Yep. So she's been identified, but her homicide case is still open. Um, and there's a lot of strange factors to her case. Like her case has a lot of, um, and we do dig into a lot of the mysteries um, in her case, but there's some that are, there's just so many strange angles in the case. So, yeah. Um, is there, we have another person that wrote in that would like to know, um, is there something, because is there something that has you hopeful when it comes to solving does in the future? Like, is there more development or more people on the ground trying to champion in cases? Yes. Something that you, yeah. 
So I think it's like, I think there's stuff coming in from like several different directions. Um, I think one direction is technology. Um, you know, the technology gets better every day. Um, it's not, there's things like the Andy machine, which is a rapid DNA uh, machine right now. It's, it's STR DNA, which is the more classic DNA. Um, but that's still like nothing to, you know, sniff at, um, because we still need that STNR DNA that still identifies a lot of people. And that's that DNA that's not used for forensic genetic genealogy, right? But we still ID people there that way very often. Um, I think that a lot more people are interested in solving these cases. Um, and because of that, funding is more accessible. Um, there's several nonprofits that are paying for it. I think that the amount of people who are doing forensic, you know, investigative genetic genealogy has grown exponentially. There are several um, college uh, associated training programs now, you know, that there were zero two years ago. And now there's several that are associated directly with colleges. NamUs is now providing forensic, forensic investigative genetic genealogy. Um, the FBI is doing it. I mean, so I think that the, that the world is opening up for this. Um, and I think that people who are interested in true crime are starting to realize that doe cases are a concern as well. You know, for, we have at least 40,000 unidentified persons in the U.S., and that's a terrible statistic because it hasn't truly been updated since 2006. So that was a statistic that shocked me when I read that because I was just in the dark when it came to the amount you mean of doe cases and the fact that just that number hadn't been updated and the reporting on some of it, not everything had gone into. Yeah. yeah. We just don't know. We just really don't know. That was something I was in the dark about entirely. And now I went and I was searching on name is to see in our area cases and all of that. Um, we have a question here from Mary. She wanted to know about, you had mentioned in the beginning about students when you were still teaching. Are any of your students still involved and have any of them gone into this field after taking your course? So a couple of them work for me, um, you know, on a part-time basis. Um, so um, a couple of my former students are uh, working for me part-time doing research for the podcast. Um, several of Dr. Amy Michael's students worked with us um, on the you know on the case for the book and they are also as well so yeah um i have a couple of students who have you know ended up involved in this um that's the one thing i miss about being a professor is the students um any excuse to talk to um 18 to 25 year olds about things they're passionate about is like one of my favorite things in the world um i love teaching you know not the meetings so much uh, i could skip the faculty <laughs> meetings but the teaching i love so you also, we had a lot of questions. People had asked about some of the fields we're very familiar, we're, we think we're familiar with because we've seen it on TV. Like, like that. no, it's, it never is. But um, can you share some common misconceptions that you've discovered in your time? The labs are nothing like TV. Um, you know, no, no spinning 4D, you know, boop, 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 you know, forensic art takes much longer. Um, everything takes longer. It's dirtier. Uh, you know, uh, no one has any money. <laughs> um, you know, it just, you know, everything's much more lo-fi than on TV. It takes much longer. Um, no one walks up and says, you know, bone style, this is a crime scene because it's a recovery scene. Um, figuring out if something's historic or forensic can take much, much longer. Test results take weeks or months to get back. Um, you know, it's just a much slower process, but I'm sure everyone understands that because the plot wouldn't move along otherwise. Um, and the biggest thing for me, though, is like, you know, um, cases don't resolve in the way that we feel like they do on TV, you know, because I work with families, um, you know, on the fall line, I work with families who are waiting for answers, who have been waiting for years. Um, and when I work on Doe cases, oftentimes I work with families where I am waiting to find them and then we find them and I work with them when they're processing that. And for them, the case isn't over when they get that answer. Um, so I think that idea of what resolution is, is something that's very different in real life as well. I would agree. Um, I'm trying to see here. 
is there anything you're currently working on or do you have like plans for future books, future cases you'd like to highlight? So um, I'm always working on cases. Um, the Fall Lines new season is starting Wednesday. We have 22 unidentified persons cases with Metro Nashville PD. Um, we had done two unidentified persons cases with Metro Nashville and two missing persons cases. And then the detective there was really pleased with some information we were able to get into him on a case, on two cases. And so then he said, here's 22 cases. So we're doing <laughs> to unidentified persons cases starting then. Um, it doesn't matter where you live, um, you may have information on these cases. So we really encourage people not only to listen, but to share the flyers we're going to have up for these cases. Um, it takes one person to share it to the right place to solve a case. I cannot stress this enough. Regular people help solve doe cases every day. Perhaps more than any other kind of case, a regular person, anybody out the street can solve a doe case. Um, and in terms of my own writing, I am going to um, be I'm going to be working. I'm currently working actually on a novel um, back to my roots, uh, but it is it's a supernatural Appalachian novel. Uh, so I do say Appalachian. I'm I'm from the South, uh, but with a forensic twist because I can't seem to help myself. So that's what I'm working on. And also some doe cases where uh, I'm working on some doe cases with Dr. Amy Michael where DNA is not available. Uh, up in uh, New England. I would say I did some further research on Dr. Amy Michaels after because I just thought her work was fascinating and what she's doing in the field was, I had, I wanted to know more after the book. But um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I really enjoyed your I really enjoyed the book and encourage all of you to check out um, Lay Them to Rest, which is available from our local independent bookstore. All of our copies at the library have been checked out since the day it was published. So it is a hot book to get their hands on here. Um, but I encourage you all to check that out there. And then I'm, I encourage you all to check out or follow along with Laura's work and um, the fall line, which season starts next week so, or this Wednesday. Yeah, I think uh what ooh tomorrow is today Tuesday, tomorrow? It's Monday. Okay. Oh good. Okay, wow. Wednesday, yeah, two days. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining us and thank you, Laura, for joining us this evening. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.